everyone, and welcome to episode 40. Uh, well, episode 40, well, uh, of the Impact Code podcast. I'm thrilled to have you all here, and thank you so much for listening, for engaging, and for subscribing to the content. Um, whether you're listening to this or whether you're watching on the YouTube channel, we really appreciate you being a part of the community. Um, I'm thrilled today to be joined by Cindy Paluta, who is a sports broadcaster who, no doubt, you would have uh, seen and heard, much like myself. Um, it's an absolute privilege, Cindy, to have you here with us. Um, how are you doing on this chilly Joburg Saturday morning? Well, thank you for having me with you. It's very exciting. Uh, the voice is a bit croaky. It's very, as for a Saturday morning, this is early, <laughs> but uh, otherwise fabulous. No, wonderful. It's awesome to have you on the on the podcast, and thank you for graciously accepting the invitation to to join us. I'm sure our listeners are keen to get to know you a little bit better. And on that note, um, you know, tell us a little bit about yourself in terms of you know where you were born as well as you know where you grew up. So, with um, regards to that, my life is pretty boring. <laughs> I was born in Johannesburg. And I've lived in Joburg my whole life, which I know is very strange because most people born in Joburg and leave or are born somewhere else and come to Joburg. But I've literally born, bred, lived in Joburg my whole life. No, awesome. I I am I am uh, one of those most people. <laughs> I grew up in Joburg and then left. <laughs> you know, uh, went to go to the sea to study. But yeah, I am one of those most people. But I think. Yeah, Joburg is my favorite city. I don't, I don't hide that. I absolutely love it. I agree. I agree. Exactly, right? It's amazing. <laughs> it's amazing. There's just something so unique about Joburg. And when you, you know, sometimes you'll go on a holiday to somewhere within the country or perhaps you travel abroad. You come back and there's just something, like there's something about the city yeah. that is just awesome. Exactly, exactly. You, you and I get it. Maybe the others don't. <laughs> you and I get it. No, awesome. So, so you, I mean, obviously have been a part of so many sporting moments on air, um, you know, in, in your illustrious career thus far. And I'm quite curious, you know, what is your, what would you say is your favorite sporting moment that you've worked on in the last five years? Uh, particularly, if I screen it down to the last five years in particular, what would you say that is? I I really hate those questions. <laughs> it's like it's like the same question as what's your favorite sport? Yeah. <laughs> like I hate those questions because there've been so many moments in mm. the last 5 years and then you kind of go hmm what would I say and then the big normal ones spring to mind you know the the rugby world cup or you know soccer cricket whatever comes to mind. Um and I think within my um field because being in radio and um, every morning, you've got to put a full bulletin together that's not more than two minutes long. And you have to capture every sport. So you have to know every sport. So I think if you had um, interviewed like a, a sports journal who's got a particular beat, they'd be able to say, oh, this in the last five years. But for me, there are so many impactful ones. And some that we don't even think about, it was, South Africa finishing third in the Netball World Cup. And, you know, we lost by one point to make it to the final. I think that was about three years ago. It's it's that kind of thing. Um, it's the little ones for me that really make it. Like in, in MotoGP, how well Brad Binder does. So the, the Springboks and the Protests, although the Protests haven't got any trophies, but the Springboks, <laughs> it's such a subject. Um, the Springboks, the Protests, all of those are obvious. So for me, it's more the small guys. Um, and off the top of my head, I can't think of any one big moment that's been fun to cover in the last five years. It's all been epic. No, I think, and, and I mean, those moments that you have mentioned, I think were, were special, special memories and, and special moments. I think that, you know, no doubt inspired lots and lots of people. Um, you know, so I, 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 I totally get what you need in terms of favorite. You know, it's hard to, to pick one in particular. Um, so I've, I've, I've followed you on, on Twitter and, and, and Instagram for a while. And I, 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 I've seen that you're an avid TikToker. <laughs> yeah, that's, that's, um, that's fairly new, that platform, right? Yeah. Um, we've yeah. been around for a while. It was Musical.ly, um, which was a whole bunch, you know, which got slammed because people thought it was just like a whole bunch of teenagers just dancing to music and 
and lip syncing and stuff. And then lately we've seen the growth of TikTok. Yeah. Um, I've got a teenage daughter and she's been into TikTok for quite a while now. And I actually enjoy the platform and the creativity of it. So I've, I've, I've been on it for a while. I'm too scared to post. Because apparently, according to my kids, everything's lame. That's lame. That's lame. But then I like, I kind of go, hang on a sec. Look how many views I got. You know, yes. It's not lame. Um, but yeah, uh, TikTok is TikTok's fun. It's really a lot of fun. It is. I mean, so I, I'm, I'm, I'm curious. I know they say that the content that you're posting is lame. But would you say that you're better at them than better than them at, at TikTok? Like in, in your mind, or what would you say? I think. The content's completely different, right? 43-year-old yeah. mom as opposed to the teenager. Um, yeah. Some of the stuff they post really is like music, lip syncing to music and stuff. Whereas um, on my TikTok, I will, for example, recently did a, um, we had Black Coffee in the studio come into 947, yeah. so I did a video on that. Um, we had this crazy game where we, we put one of my colleagues inside like a take a lot shower and these take a lot baths. Yeah, so and that, that video got so many hits and then like I recently posted one of like just a day in the life of how my how the office looks, what happens when I get in, you know, driving to work, that kind of thing. What happens when I get there? So it's like I'm a little bit like all over the place there. I haven't I haven't read you know, like an Instagram, everybody kind of has what their Instagram page must feel like. Yes, yes. If you look at my social, it's very erratic. There's no feel, <laughs> there's no look. It's just, it's who I am in the moment. And that's who I am in like real life. Uh, what you see is what you get. So I think my social media is like an exact reflection of that. Yeah, and it's, 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 it's authentic, right? It's, 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 yeah. it's pretty much, you know, who you are. And unfortunately, working in this industry, I know a lot of what happens behind the scenes in terms of social, you know, and I know when companies approach you and they're like, please post this, please post that, that kind of thing, which mm. is no problem. But when you see, when you know what other people are doing it, it's kind of like, hmm. So mine's, I try to keep mine authentic. Um, and also if if a big company comes to me and they say, we would like you to do this. And there was one, I think last year that was like, we would like you to eat this cereal and post it with your kids eating it. And I replied, I was like, no, my kids don't like your cereal. So, <laughs> you know, it's it's genuine. Yeah. I wouldn't post something that I don't agree with or don't, haven't seen or don't like because that's not genuine. Yeah, that's an incredibly principled view and I think really admire that. I, I, I think your your content is, is super authentic and I think <laughs> anybody who, who does follow you, uh, you know, will, will agree with me, I'm sure. Um, so let's let's talk about lessons that you've learned um, from you know making an impact through through your work in in radio specifically. Um, so I'm curious, you know, tell me a little bit about how did you get there in the oh. first? <laughs> well, why radio? How did you get into radio? My second worst question. Because, well, actually third, because first is what's the biggest event you've ever covered. My second is what's your favorite sport. And my third is how did you get into radio? And I got into radio by sheer luck, just right place, right time. So I'm very fortunate and I know I am. I didn't have to go off and study and work at a community station and, you know, follow all the steps that everybody else has followed. I literally took like a, a, a student job at Talk Radio 702. Yeah. And I mean... I know this sounds crazy, but at the time, like, I didn't even, in my head, I didn't even know that you could work on radio. I know I'm like 18, 19, and I should, <laughs> you can, obviously can work on radio, but I didn't know that that was like an, an avenue that was open to people. Mm -hmm. um, and I guess these days, with social media and with the internet and everything, people are able to get jobs or see jobs or apply for jobs that perhaps they didn't think they would be able to do. So mine was literally, it was a student job answering telephones at Talk Radio 702 and it developed from there, um, mm -hmm. from reporting on the traffic and then it became sports. And then I, you know, moved to 947 and now I obviously do 947 and 702. So I started there, it was, it was fresh out of RC 1997 and the career has just grown and I've, I've never wanted to leave radio ever. I absolutely love radio. I love what I'm doing. There've been times where I've gone, oh, maybe this is it. Like maybe this is my last year, but I can't imagine what I would fill that space with or yeah. what I would do because 
it's such an amazing platform to be on that and it, and it brings you a lot of joy you know so it's I, I truly am I know it I know I'm lucky like I'm sorry I don't have an, have an answer for the listeners as to you know they're probably listening going oh how do I get into radio I do not have that answer for you I don't have that answer for you yeah and it, it really takes a lot of uh you know a certain type of character to, to really say that and I think I really applaud you for that um you know no doubt no matter how you got in I think no doubt you have had a, a stellar career thus far and you know, within that I'm sure there have been some some challenging moments and challenging seasons and I'm quite keen to to dive a little bit into that you know and, and would be quite keen to know if you could share you know some of the lessons that maybe you've learned in the, in that process of of those challenging seasons so the thing that I've that I've definitely learned, um, and this is for anybody who's thinking of getting into broadcast or whatever, you will you will always be in the right place at the right time for what's for you. So um, I also did five years of TV at Supersport, which was awesome. That was a that was also I, I went to a rugby game um, for work. Was you know socializing after the game. The 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 um. The lady in the marketing department from Supersport was there. She met me, thought I was wonderful, knew they were having auditions. Mm. Said to them, get Cindy in. I auditioned. I was, I, and that, again, Supersport and TV was never even a possibility because people on Supersport are superstars, right? Mm. Um, and I did five years there as well. And between radio and TV um, and just in the field and stuff, and we've come a very long way. So, I mean, I've been in broadcasting now since 97, been in sports broadcasting since about 2001. So yeah, 20 years. Mm. Um, we've come a long way in terms of women in broadcasting. So when I started to be a woman in sports broadcasting was a huge thing. Yeah. Um, for me now, 20 years later, I feel the narrative's boring because there's so many women in sports broadcasting now, but it's a great testament to how far we've come. And I would say those are the challenges that we have. It's the, um, the challenges that we face basically in everyday life. And I'm sure you would have the same in your career and your job. It's mm -hmm. the public's expectation of who you are and what you do and what they believe your deliverable is. Um, and I think that's where the challenge comes in is that because I'm a public figure and I know sport, well, when I go to a bra on a Saturday night, I should just I should be able to rattle off like all these facts and figures and know everything when I don't necessarily. Mm -hmm. So people expect a lot more from you and expect you to be a lot more knowledgeable about everything than what you than what you might be. Yeah. So interesting, very interesting, you know, sentiments shared there. I think it is quite relevant, um, you know, in terms of also how we how we deal with that as well. And you know, in your career, you obviously have worked incredibly hard to get to where you are today. And, and um, I'm quite curious, you know, one of the things that has probably come up a lot more uh, over the last three to four years or so is, is around work-life balance. And I'm quite curious, you know, firstly, the beginning of your career, how you achieved that. And now as well with your family, you know, how do you sort of achieve that balance between the two? Work-life balance, oh, this is, no one's ever asked me this. Uh, because I have to reflect back because obviously I started as, as a student. Mm. So this is going to sound so bad because I would go from the jaw, from the from the nightclub or whatever to work because I, I've always, I started off on breakfast, mm. you know, helping on breakfast. I wasn't on air, but yep. I was writing the traffic on breakfast. And I would have to say to my friends, I've got to go. And the person's, you know, mopping the floor in the club. And I'm like, I've got to go. I'm going to be late for work. <laughs> and we used to laugh about it. Mm. And my friends often used to say to me, you know, oh, you know, you get up so early and it's not worth it. And I'm like, a short-term sacrifice, long-term goal. That's always been my motto because people today think that you're going to go in somewhere and, you know, you're going to be famous immediately and you're not. Mm. After becoming a student, got married. Um, my husband's very understanding because I always worked flexi hours and I was already in the industry when I met him. So he understood the, the, the work and I was working radio and TV at the same time. So the hours did get long. When yeah. I had kids, it became a little bit more tricky. And yeah. that's why I left Supersport because um, at Supersport, it's a bit erratic. So, um, you know, you're working predominantly weekends, obviously, sport happens on weekends. You can't go work for Supersport and then say, well, actually, I don't want to work Saturdays because I want to go to, you know, what's it, Newtown and have a jaw with my friends. Like, you, 
you have to you have to do it you have to have a lot of sacrifices if you want to get anywhere and um so once i had kids that's where the work-life balance comes in right because before you have before you have kids you kind of you can work as much as you want yeah so i gave up the tv for the radio which was more consistent um and there were times in radio when i was i was sports editor of ewn from 2013 to 2017 mm -hmm. and i gave that up from because of burnout and not being able to juggle everything so you're never going to be a hundred percent you you as a working mom you're always going to feel like somebody's not getting a hundred percent when your kids are getting a hundred percent you're going to feel like your work's not getting a hundred percent when your work's getting a hundred percent you feel like your family's not getting a hundred percent and you know juggling all the time the only way to balance that is to actually look inwards and go how do i feel am i happy is this serving me if I walk away from this, is it going to affect me in the long run? And that's why I stepped back from the editor role because I just didn't have the capacity to do that, but stay within radio, if that makes sense. Yeah, I think it's incredibly important um, in terms of what you said around looking inward, really asking yourself those difficult questions. I think sometimes when things get really busy, you know, people tend to not do that. They tend to sort of go on autopilot and keep going. And then you don't end up achieving that balance because you don't look inward and you don't really you know, take the time to ask yourself those questions. And it's a very fine line because there's a fine line between this job makes me miserable and I'm going to go find something else. Mm. Well, actually, if you had just worked it through or just pushed a little bit harder, you could have made it. Yeah. But at the same time, it's also like you can't just... And I know that I'm speaking, well, not really, but it's a, you can't sometimes walk away from a job. You're kind yeah. of you're trapped. You need the money. Life's expensive. Electricity, when we have it, is expensive. Yeah. Um, water, all of that. And people have bills and kids and whatever. So you can't always walk away from something. But it's about actually having that balance and pushing back. And I think the one good thing that did come out of COVID mm. was that I think employers realized people can work from home. They have families, yeah. they need to look after their families. Or Absolutely. mental illness became very big in COVID. Yeah. And people, um, people are more outspoken about it. You know, like people don't feel bad now to say, actually, I need to take a mental day. Mm. And take it. So, yeah, um, work-life balance is key. Yeah, absolutely. I, I'm, a, I, I'm in full support of exactly what you said. I think it, it's incredibly important um, for us as, as, as working professionals to, to be able to achieve that and to make sure that those we work with as well have the space to be able to do that as well, you know. Um, and what, <laughs> I guess an interesting question is, what advice would you give to the young ambitious professionals who are listening to the show? Um, you know, what two or three pieces of advice would you give, I guess, from your knowledge and, and, and from what you've gained? Um, I think I've touched on, I think I've touched on quite a bit of it, mm. but what I would say is, um, stay true to who you are, never change who you are, because as soon as you change who you are to fit in or serve a different narrative, it's going to create a resistance within yourself because you, and you're going to feel like an imposter in your own life if you don't stay true to who you are, right? So without blowing my own trumpet a lot of people have said to me the reason that they like me on air or listen to me on air is because i'm real i don't i'm not here to put on a show and a dance and mm. do whatever like i'm here for the sheer love of it um in your job you will know if you are being treated well or not and you have to speak up your your employer is not going to come to you and say you know what you're working so hard mm. we should improve your life they're not going to <laughs> they don't know yeah. um, and also something that I learned very recently, which kind of made me look at life in a different way, mm. is that you are the only important person in your life. So, so when you go through life, you go, oh, well, how come, you know, how come I'm not getting promoted? Or how come everyone's overlooking me or whatever? But your employer is sitting behind his own, is sitting behind his desk, worrying about what he needs to worry about. He's not worrying about you. You mm. are the only one worrying about you. And you've got to look after you. Um, so I would say to young professionals uh, coming through, it's just literally never, never compromise on who you are, mm. because that you will go further in life if you just literally in your in your career in life in your happiness, friends, everything. Don't compromise who you are to try and please other people. 
yeah, incredibly powerful that, and 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 thank you for that advice. Um, I think it is incredibly powerful and, and profound, and so thank you for that. Um, as a final question, Cindy, um, how would you say you make an impact in your world? Um, yeah, another difficult one. And um, so I often come home and I say to my family, you know, like, I really don't know how I'm making a difference. Like, I literally just wake up, write a sport bulletin, read it on air. Like, I don't see how I'm making a difference. But so often you'll get messages from people like this. Please will you come on my podcast and tell us your amazing story and how you got it in so you can impact others. And mm -hmm. you forget that this is making an impact, right? Or I heard you on the radio this morning and you sounded so happy and so lovely and it brightens my day. Mm. Or, um, you know, because we, I work with Inner Breakfast Show, we're all a team. If, for example, last month a lady's house burned down and the radio station, well, our, our, our team um, on Anelia and the Club, mm. you know, rebuild her house, refurnish it, all of that, you're, you've got to feel part of it. Yeah. You might not be in part of the actual, you know, logistics of it. You might not have been the brainchild behind it, but you've got to realize that if, if you weren't there in that space and time, perhaps it wouldn't have happened. Mm. So that's the only way that I can think. And then also, I also think that um, just as I listened to the radio and couldn't believe people could work on the radio, I think hearing a woman's sports broad broadcaster doing, mm. you know, sport is that opens a lot of doors for a lot of women who don't believe that they can do men's roles or men's predominantly stereotypical men's jobs yeah. in an everyday world. Yeah, certainly. And, and you know, all of what you said and more, I think, is, is how you have made an impact. And I think, you know, one, one thing which I said to you off air that I, I used to listen to you when I was in school <laughs> and we're going back after, you know, rugby and, and cricket practice. And I think one thing which always came through, you're very happy. And so it was impossible to listen to you and be sad. <laughs> so I think... You well, you know, <laughs> just this week I said to my colleagues, I know I'm old because the people that listen to me on the way to school are having kids now. <laughs> so I'm getting married. <laughs> yeah. Fair enough, fair enough, fair enough. <laughs> Nervous Sydney, thank you so much for coming on to the Impact Code podcast, for being episode 40 of our journey. Thank you so much for the wonderful words of wisdom and genuine, you know, advice that you've shared. And it's inspiring to have heard, you know, your story and to have, you know, continued to see your career uh, flourish and grow and may continue to do that. And so from us at Impact Co, um, I want to say thank you very much. I hope that you've enjoyed it as well. Yeah, thank you to you so much because um, it's it's people like you. I mean, 40 episodes in, that's amazing. I mean, that's Silas. People don't realize how hard you work behind the scenes to have this podcast going. So thank you to you for having me. Um, yeah, allowing me just to share a little bit of my story. No, wonderful. And we look forward to welcoming you back on the show in the future. And to you, the listener and the watcher, thank you so much uh, for being a part of the journey and continuing to engage, to listen, to share and to watch this content. And from Cindy and myself, we want to say thank you so much and goodbye.